Which one do you want? The uh, M1? So more mass than water, and that's methane. If we have methane as gas one, we put that down here. What's going to be the rate of methane? What's the rate of methane? Okay, 3.3. What will be the rate of the other gas? One to make it easy. Okay, you can obviously say something else if you want to make it harder on yourself. So the rate here is 3.3 times R2. So with our map here, we've got R1 and R2. 3.3 squared times 16.042. And that equals 174.7 grams per mole. Okay, so once we get the molar mass, now all we need to do is figure out what form of this nickel compound would be the correct one. So NiCOx, we want it to be proportional to 174.70. So we got nickel, we got carbon and oxygen, X's are unknown. We don't know what the x is, so we set up the molar mass. This has to be equal that plus that times x, and we solve for x. x equals 4.1, which is equal to 4, and that is your compound here of this nickel gas. Nickel compound, I should say. So, questions about steps on this? Yeah, so I set this uh, R2, I set R2 equal to 1 because it's 3.3 times it. So that's where you can assume that R2 is 1 and it makes it easier. If you kept it as R2, then uh, you would have 3.3 times R2 squared, and the R2 is equal to 3.3 squared times R squared, and then R squared is on the bottom as well. R2 squared is on the bottom. All right. Now, you do not have to assume R2 is 1 because this would be 3.3 times R2, and then that quantity is squared. So 3.3 squared times R2, R2 squared on the top, and R2 squared is on the bottom. So if you have the same on the top and the bottom, they cancel out. So that's why you can use this, and the R2s cancel out. So that would be a problem using Graham's Law of Diffusion. Okay, we've learned how to use all of the gas laws, the ideal gas law, Graham's Law. Okay, all of those laws we should be able to answer questions on. Okay, now, tomorrow we will have a quiz, daily quiz on some of those gas laws. Obviously, we should cover up till today, but usually what happens is we cover what we learned first on the first quiz. So tomorrow's quiz will be on gases first part of gases, and any of the gas laws we've learned so far will be up for fair game. It'll probably look something like this, but maybe not with this law. Yep. With organic chemistry quiz, what can we do before the acid? Organic chemistry quiz? Uh, organic chemistry was for uh, nomenclature. Um, and being familiar with organic nomenclature and then for reaction chemistry, which we have on Friday. So we got we got quiz on reaction prediction on Friday. So there's no quiz on organic chemistry. Organic nomenclature? I don't think so. All I can say. No. No. Can't give me any samples. Every single sample I gave you is what it's going to be like for the gas quizzes on tomorrow and on Thursday. So one thing to be aware of this week is also to prepare us for the uh, quarter two test. Quarter one test. I mean quarter one final. Sorry. Wrong quarter. Quarter one final. So everything we do will be to prepare you for that. So this week we will be having a quiz tomorrow. A quiz on Thursday. And we have a reaction quiz on Friday. And on Wednesday we have a lab quiz. Uh, all of the, every day when you come in, you'll be taking a quiz. What it says online is what we're doing. So look online if you're unsure of what is where. Yeah. The new sheets are.
saya Isi saya terlepas ya talking about ideal gases, we can always assume that something's an ideal gas. If it's not an ideal gas, it would fit into what's known as real gases. Most defined gases obey the ideal gas law, but real gases do not. They deviate from ideal gas law behavior. P, v equals NRT is no longer accurate with real gases. Now, what is meant by that? The reason why is they are not ideal because real gas particles have definite volume. They have a definite volume, so the volume of the gas is not equal to the volume of the container. They also exhibit, and this is the, one of the important things, intermolecular attractive forces. Okay? This is a more significant factor on why they may not behave ideally. So the pressure of a real gas is less than the pressure of an ideal gas. So if you calculate the pressure to be a certain amount, if it's a real gas, it's gonna be less than the ideal because there are some attractive forces between these molecules. Almost, or not all, but many molecules, there's an attractive force of some sort. These intermolecular attractions might be dipole-dipole uh, attractions or even uh, slight charges on the molecules themselves uh, that would cause attractions or repulsions, um, but there are some attractive forces that are a significant factor. So the pressure of a real gas is going to be less than the pressure of an ideal gas is one key factor. If you look here at this graph, here it shows ideal gases. They have a molar volume here. As you go up in pressure, you'll notice that the ideal gas Okay, has a lower molar volume than the real gas, in this case, argon. So at high temperatures, okay, at high temperatures and at high pressures, the non-ideal gas does not behave the same. The volume actually is slightly larger than the ideal gas here. Now, the volume is slightly larger, so that means the pressure is going to be slightly smaller. That's another reason why you can see from the graph and from the data that would show. Now, when does this happen? As you go closer and closer to pressure, if pressure is below 200 atmospheres, it's almost ideal. What's our pressure right now? One atmosphere. Like, we're like, maybe there on it. Right? But it doesn't even go up there. The reason why is at one atmosphere, normal pressure conditions, at least in our atmosphere, these two, same behavior. So it has to be at high temperature, high pressure for non-ideal behaviors. Now, the other thing that it happens is, let's say we have an ideal gas and xenon, okay? The ideal gas here, as the pressure goes up, the temperature would go up. But as the temperature goes down, you'll notice that it does not behave like an ideal gas. Okay. As the temperature goes down, lower and lower and lower towards zero, the separation gets larger and larger. So this is a, this is a big factor uh, when the temperature goes down. So when it's a high temperature and high pressure, it's not ideal. When it's a low temperature and the pressure gets much, much lower, that's when you start to get non-ideal gases. So when it's a very low temperature, this is when we get some non-ideal gas behavior. And we can see here, this has to be a very high pressure still. Almost 25 atmospheres in order to have a separation at 300 Kelvin, which is room temperature. So at room temperature, we gotta have high pressure and low temperature to get non-ideal gas behavior. So if we got regular temperature, regular pressure, you're not gonna get a separation. 
if we look here at the molar volume of these gases, ideal gas is 22.41 liters is its molar volume. Which one here has the smallest molar volume? Chlorine gas. That means the chlorine gas has the greatest amount of what between the gas particles? Right? Greatest attraction. The greatest intermolecular attractions seem to be happening in this chlorine. And you can see here, which one is most like the ideal gas? Helium. Which one has a slightly larger volume? Hydrogen. Slightly larger, at least measurable, whether that is significant or not. So this here is a relationship for non-ideal gases. They almost all have 22.4 on average, but you can see some variation depending on the gas. Okay. Now the intermolecular forces that are at play here are attractions between molecules. Inter means between. Internet is a computer network between computers. Right? Intranet is actually, does anyone know what an intranet is? A very, yeah, it is a network that is not between, between computers. So, the definition of intermolecular forces means between molecules. As the molar mass increases, the number of electrons increases. So the larger the molar mass, the larger the number of electrons. As the number of electrons increases, the strength of attractive forces between molecules also increase. That's because if you have more electrons, there's more negative to charge, and you have more positive protons, the negative and positive have a larger attraction to one another. The strength of the force decreases as the distance increases. So unless they're close, you will not have that attraction, especially between gas particles. They move at such a high velocity. This force is called either London dispersion force or Van der Waals attraction. <laughs> so these are intermolecular uh, forces called IMFs. Sometimes people even call them IMAs, intermolecular attractions because they would seem to be attracting the molecules together. So if you have an ideal gas, there is no attraction between them. This moves, these move, but they are not attracted to one another. If you have a real gas, this particle is passing through, these get attracted, these get attracted, and these get attracted, depending on the distance between the particles, of course, and their molar masses. So the gas particles move slower than predicted when there is an attractive force existing. Right? It's slower than predicted because instead of just going straight with no forces acting on them, there are forces that are acting on them in multiple directions, slowing them down, slowing down their kinetic molecular, uh, slowing down their average velocity. It's representing the forces of attraction. Forces of attraction. Uh -huh. That's the, is that because of the um, number of electrons in the mm -hmm. Yep, number of electrons on the outside. And one thing that's not mentioned is why do they have more attraction with electrons? Uh, it also has to do with the positive charge in the middle. That's why we have uh, bonds forming in the first place, is the positive negative attraction. So these attractions don't usually cause them to stick, but just slow down the molecule as it's passing through other molecules. Yeah. So it's not because of the different gases, it's just because before we were looking at it this way. Yep. And now we're looking at it this way. Exactly. Exactly. And these can all be the same gas, even though they're different colors. Okay. We're just saying, hey, we're looking at red molecules. Now. The one thing that could be concluded from this for real gases is the velocity of real gases is going to be less than the velocity of ideal gases. So they're going to have less uh, less, kine uh, less kinetic energy, average kinetic energy. Yeah. But won't there also be some repulsive forces as well? Uh, there could be some repulsive forces, but it's usually the... Uh, the attractive forces that um, are larger in the space and cause the changes. So the collisions are 
Uh, there are interactions acting constantly between molecules, um, and the, the repulsive forces. Uh, repulsive forces would cause changes in their orientation, so that would slow them down as well. Which, you know, so you'd also think sometimes in this watch, it should be that because all happens as well. But, yeah. Uh, temperatures should be higher, yes. Yeah, in theory, the temperature should be higher, but you would have to cons everything else would have to be constant. So average velocity, yes, would be correct. The temperature should agree with that in terms of uh, the proportion. So the temperature should agree with that as well. Now, since the velocity of a collision is less, so they're moving with less speed, they collide again with less velocity, this means also the pressure exerted by a gas is less than predicted. So they're not moving as fast, they don't hit the side of the walls as fast, they don't have as much pressure. So that's why the pressure of an ideal gas okay, is going to be greater than the pressure of a real gas because of these attractions. Slow down the speed, slow down the pressure of the collisions. So, ideal gas has greater speed, greater pressure as well, and less observable volume or mole. Now, deviations from ideal behavior. If you have one mole of an ideal gas, PV equals nRT, N is PV over RT, so this ratio equals one if you have one mole of a gas. If you look at this ratio here, Okay. For an ideal gas, it should be right here at one. If you look at these gases here with different pressures, zero to 12,000 atmospheres, ammonia actually has, behaves less like a gas here at low, at low pressures, and its ratio is going to be much lower than one, but eventually it does go above the ideal gas ratio. So this is why you can have deviations like methane and hydrogen that are not behaving like the one mole standard of an ideal gas. And at lower pressures here, these both have a dip down in their um, PV over RT ratio. And then at higher, the ratio uh, increases. And so you've got changes that occur because of that ratio. This is caused by attractive forces on the bottom and then why you see the, uh, the N ratio being larger is because of repulsive forces. So they do play a role in, and especially as the pressure goes higher and higher for most of these gases. Hydrogen does not have that attractive forces um, to slow it down. Yeah. Can you define uh, repulsive forces would be if you had um, you have a force of attraction between the negative electrons and the positive protons, and then a repulsive force would be between two positives or between two negatives. They tend to repel each other. So you would even think you got a bunch of electrons here in one, one atom and a bunch in another atom or molecule. They come together, you'd expect them to repel, but they also have that force of attraction. So um, the repulsion usually happens when you have higher pressures, more collisions and more collisions cause them to be closer together, which allows them to repel one another. Yeah? Wouldn't more molecular repulsive forces mean more attractive volume have less moles of gas? No, this is a larger, a larger amount, proportional amount of gas. So you have a, this is mole, the mole ratio. So one mole of an ideal gas, these here would be like, behaving like they're more than one mole. So if you had one mole of NH3 at extremely high pressure, it would behave like it's 1.3 moles. And if it's 1.3 moles, you would also assume it, what's up? Well, it, 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 would have a, it would have a larger volume most likely. Okay, the volume would, 
to take up more space for this end ratio. Yeah. Is there a volume that you can do, like, uh, There's a few things that are happening. There's volume, there's pressure, and there's temperature all affecting it. The volume and pressure seem these are usually the biggest factors. Temperature plays the role, especially at low temperatures. As you decrease this down, 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 the pressure and volume go down as well. So you've got a lot of confusing variables. So it's not just the, the fact that the volume gets bigger, it's also the temperature. Yep, all three of them play a role. That's why we're using the ideal gas instead of uh, Avogadro's law or something like that. Now, if we look at these, uh, these molecules here, how would we rank these in increasing order of deviation from ideal gas behavior? too fast for the IMFs to be significant. So they're traveling too fast through the medium and there's not enough gas particles around it in the first place. So this here is a gas at low pressure and a gas at high pressure. At low pressure you'll notice there's less intermolecular forces. At high pressure there's more intermolecular forces Right? And this is what can change, again, the speed of the individual particles. So if we look here, carbon dioxide also. Carbon dioxide also at very at lower pressures. It okay, behaves like a smaller gas. But at higher pressures, again, it has a larger ratio. This is or three temperatures here, ideal gas would behave like this. At 203 Kelvin, the nitrogen behaves differently. You'll notice it dips down. This is less ideal gas behavior. At 673 at high temperatures, it behaves more like a what? More like the ideal gas. So this is more like the ideal gas, less and even less here. So, real gases, PV equals NIT is not accurate for real gases at high pressure and low temperature. 
you must correct for the fact that real gases have definite volume and IMFs. You must account for that. So, Mr. Van der Waals right here. 1837-1923, Johannes. He came up with a way of accounting for... He accounted for these intermolecular forces by changing PV equals NRT. The P got altered here. The P got altered here, and the NRT stayed the same. Now, it is in green. If it's in green, do you think you might have to know this? Yeah, definitely it's. But you have to think about where this came from. Okay? So A, we gotta know what A is. A is the letter of the alphabet, it's the first one. But in this case, it is constant that corrects for intermolecular forces. So it's a correction factor. And B is a constant that corrects for volume of gas particles. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you have to memorize the constant. But I'll put this on your uh, maybe you crazy memory again. So the intermolecular forces, intermolecular forces affect the pressure and the volume constant affects the volume, of course. Because intermolecular forces slow down the molecules, slower velocity, less collisions, less pressure. We can think of this here. N is the number of particles squared and then the volume squared times this correction factor. So pressure is affected by the volume you have and the amount of material you have. So the amount of material squared, the volume squared, and then the volume of the gas particles. If you've got lots of gas particles, are you going to have a bigger volume? Lots of gas particles are going to affect this overall, overall volume. Because remember, this volume was assuming the gas particles had how much volume? Zero. So it takes away from this. Intermolecular forces add to this, and that's why PV equals NRT still works, but it's extended to all cases. This is for all gases. So in this case, this is zero for an ideal gas, and that's zero for an ideal gas. They just disappear. Now, Van der Waals constants, we're asking, do we have to memorize these? Okay, here is what they would look like in a chart. Who looked these up? Do not have to memorize them? Uh, they would be given for a problem if it was non-ideal gas, or, or you would have to have, look it up in your, your book. Yeah? Correct. The intermolecular forces, well, We've got to consider the amount of particles you have and the volume as well in this addition factor. So it's not only the constant, but the amount of particles and the volume. Yep. Uh, this should be the volume of the entire container. Now, one thing you can see, look at A and B. What do you notice about the numbers for A and B? Are they all small? No, no they're not all small. Which ones are tend to be smaller? A or B? Okay, B's tend to be smaller in general. And they are always smaller than their counterparts here. So the gases does determine the A value and the B value here for, and these are each determined experimentally for the gases. Now here's our quiz for today. Multiple choice quiz. I would like you to choose an answer that you think is best 
for this question here. I will give you about 30 seconds to think about it. Don't tell the person next to you their answer because their answer is their own. Please write down the answer. Don't tell anybody else the answer. I'm talking about you. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. You are going to raise your hand when I call out the correct letter. If I don't call out the correct letter, don't raise your hand. All right. E. Two people are wrong. D. D is in dog. D is in dog. One. One dog. B is in bat. B is in bat. One for B, two for B. C is in uh, carnival. One, two, three. And A is in alpha. More people is plus some of them. So let's see what the correct answer is. A, high pressure and low temperature. High pressure and low temperature is when chlorine is the least ideal. Least ideal. Least ideal. Least ideal. All right, now. Okay, how does some of these laws apply to our daily lives? If you look up here, this is the concentrations for some smog components versus the time of day. What? Okay, these are things that you breathe in that we uh, send into the atmosphere due to many different combustion reactions. This here shows the molecules of unburned fuel, petroleum, that are emitted into the atmosphere in parts per million. This here is other pollutants, which seem to be at the highest. What do you notice about the nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide? Okay. All right, they level out. They are lower and they level out. Okay, these gases here are more toxic than the other ones. Ozone, what happens with ozone in the time of day? Okay, it's at about noon. Okay, so as the temperature increases, Okay, you've got the ozone concentration increasing as well. And the petroleum here, why would it be high at about 9 o'clock in the morning? Maybe the morning run. Quite possible you've got more cars on the road or you've got more reactions. Okay. Other pollutants here increases afternoon. And then in the evening, the smog components all are reduced. Another relationship we can see is temperature changes also with altitude. Yes, Danny? Wait, can you explain the least ideal gas? Uh-huh. So the least ideal gas happens to be the one that has high pressure and low temperature. So the low temperature means that the molecules are moving less. So if they're moving less, their velocity is not enough to get through other molecules' forces. If they have a high pressure, that means that the molecules are going to uh, exert more and have more collisions on the side of the container. So they collide more with the side of the container, but they're not moving as fast. So the molecule is hitting other things more. And so when it's coming close or hitting another molecule, you have that attraction that slows it down. If it's moving with a slower speed and it's hitting more things, you've got more chance for attraction at that slower speed. And that is what happens to make this chlorine gas least ideal. So there's two factor, few factors going on. Now, as you look at this slide here, temperature. 
Okay, temperature at one atmosphere. As you go up in the up in the atmosphere, what happens to the uh, pressure? It goes down. This is because there are less molecules per unit air. So the N over V ratio goes down as you go up. Okay, there are less molecules. Now, when there's less molecules, you would expect the temperature to go down. But what happens? The temperature goes down, down, down until it reaches a point here. Here the temperature actually goes up. This is called a temperature inversion. The temperature is higher here and lower down here. Okay. And as you go further and further and further up, okay, in the atmosphere here, further away from the Earth, okay, the pressure is less and less and less, and okay, the temperature gets higher and higher because of the uh, sun. The energy from the sun is coming in here to give a larger velocity for those molecules. So what we know about real gases, a real gas has volume and shows signs of attractive forces, but can be easily confused with really bad gas. All right, tomorrow, tomorrow we will be looking at lab number six. Okay. Lab number six, it's a gas law lab. You'll also want to make sure you have lab 6B and 27. We'll be doing those in the next uh, next week or so. At this time, at this time, what I'm gonna uh, let you do at this time is uh, we're gonna work on any, uh, any work you need to uh, work on for chemistry, questions we need to go through or to answer. So we're gonna have some time to work for a few minutes. And uh, I also have a couple demos at the end we will do.